Good day, everyone. My name is Chris Jonas. I'm the Director of Communications with the National Association for Business Economics. We're pleased to present today's event, which is the fourth installment of our Perspectives on the Pandemic series, featuring leading voices and economic thought leaders sharing their insights with today's members. Uh, we have several other upcoming events in the series, including Daron Asamoglu from MIT on June 25th, Luis Aguidas from ECB on June 30th, Claudio Borio from the Bank for International Settlements uh, on July 2nd, and we'll have Fed Presidents Thomas Barkin and Mary Bailey, uh, excuse me, Mary Daly on July 7th. Uh, a couple other upcoming webinars uh, presented by NAVE that are free and open to the public uh, include uh, this coming Monday, June 22nd. We'll take a look at healthcare inequality in the U.S. with National Minority Quality Forum President and CEO Dr. Gary Huckrein. Then on Wednesday, June 24th next week, uh, we will have uh, Harvard uh, from Harvard, Jeremy Stein, who will take a look at an evaluation of the Fed Treasury credit programs. I also wanted to mention that the 17th annual NAVE Foundation Economic Measurement Seminar will take place virtually this year, August 31st to September 2nd. The EMS is a convenient and cost-effective program designed to strengthen your knowledge of economic statistics and analytical techniques, enhancing your ability to add value in your workplace. Registration is now available at nave.com for the Economic Measurement Seminar. Okay, on to today's event. Uh, please note that we will have Q&A open throughout today's presentation and discussion. Uh, you can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box and the panelists and co-authors will be able to respond. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event. Michael Luca is the Lee J. Steislinger, the third Associate Professor of Business Administration with Harvard Business School. Uh, Mike, please stand by. I'm gonna bring you into the program. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so over the last few months, the coronavirus pandemic has led to both a public health crisis and an economic crisis. And we've seen policymakers facing pressing questions about the impact the crisis is having, the impact new policies are having, and what the business and economic landscape might look like over the next few months, and how policymakers and organizations might help to adjust. Uh, over the last uh, few weeks, NAVE has been putting together this series on perspectives on the pandemic. And um, the idea is that as this landscape is rapidly evolving and new data is becoming available, new questions are arising, this would help to give a sense of the breadth and depth of work being done on this. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have uh, Raj Chetty joining us. So Raj is a professor of economics at Harvard University and director of Opportunity Insights. Uh, Raj has been doing fascinating work in which he's been thinking about the data landscape with respect to the pandemic. And I think the work that he's going to be presenting today echoes one of the real challenges that we've been seeing over the last few months, which is that as these questions come up, some of the traditional sources of data about economic activity aren't well suited to measuring the rapid changes that are happening over time. So Raj and his collaborators have been putting together a new set of uh, data sources coming from a variety of companies to put their pulse on uh, the economy at a granular level and helping to create uh, public data sets that people will be able to access to understand what's going on and then understand the impact of different policies. Um, so today what we're going to do is Raj is going to give an overview of this work um, and Raj's collaborators are also uh, on the line. And if people have questions or comments along the way, if you enter your questions into the chat box, um, people are going to make an effort to try to answer them as we go along. After Raj provides this overview, then we're going to be joined by uh, my co-moderator, Susan Lund. Uh, Susan is a fellow NAVE board member with me and is a partner uh, at McKinsey and a leader of the McKinsey Global Institute, where she's worked on a number of fascinating issues related to global labor markets, financial markets, and trade. After the session, uh, Susan is going to facilitate, uh, give some remarks on Raj's work and then facilitate a discussion with him. And then at the end, to the extent that there are further questions people have, uh, we'll take some audience questions for Raj and his collaborators. So uh, with that, just to make the most of the time that we have, I'm going to hand it over to Raj uh, to present. So thank you, Raj, for joining us. Thanks so much, Mike, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining the seminar. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you. So give me just a moment here to 
uh, pull up some slides. Is uh, everyone seeing these? Does that look good, Mike? Uh, great. So uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give today is uh, co-authored with John Friedman, Nathan Hendren, um, Michael Stepner, who's on the line with us today, and a big team of collaborators at Opportunity Insights, about 35 folks have been working on this project that we're going to be sharing with you. And just to echo what Mike said, we've got a number of folks on the line who are eager to answer your questions, so please feel free to ask uh, as I'm going along if anything's unclear or if you'd like to uh, ask about uh, other related issues. So uh, just to kick off here, what's the big, quick, uh, big picture question that we're seeking to answer? I think it's one that many of us have been quite interested in over uh, the past several weeks as the COVID pandemic has gripped our country. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the American economy and what policies can we implement going forward to mitigate its adverse impacts? So in thinking about that question, the data that we typically bring, uh, bring to bear on a problem like that um, is macroeconomic information uh, that's based on surveys of households and businesses. So many of us are familiar, of course, with the headline numbers that we see in the news, things like GDP and unemployment rates, which are coming from those systematic surveys that the government has implemented. And those data uh, undoubtedly provide vital information about the aggregate state of the American economy. However, our sense is that they have two key limitations in terms of forming economic policy uh, going forward. So first, as many of you will know, they are available standard data sources uh, that the government puts out. They're available only with significant time lags at relatively low frequencies. So to give a concrete example, if you take, suppose you're interested in data on consumer expenditures, you turn to something like the Consumer Expenditure Survey to get information disaggregated across states or over time. But what you'd find is you only get that data at a quarterly level, and typically it's going to take a year until you have information for the current quarter, which of course limits the capacity to use that data to inform current economic policy. A second major challenge is that most data sets that we have cannot be disaggregated in very fine ways across income groups, across areas, across sectors, to understand variation in terms of how the economic shock is affecting different types of people or different types of businesses. And so motivated by those challenges, what we're doing in this project is to build a real-time, publicly available economic tracker using transaction data from several private companies, which we really think have the best window into economic activity in the era of big data. So think of credit card processors, payroll companies, all of these companies that essentially can see a huge swath of economic activity. We're gonna take all of that data and build a publicly available tracker where you can monitor economic activity by zip code, by date. So very high frequency in a very granular manner. And we're gonna show hopefully uh, convince you that this data can be incredibly valuable for economic policy by doing two things in the talk today. First, we're gonna study differences by income group, geography, and industry. So we're gonna disaggregate that data to analyze the mechanisms through which the COVID shock has led to unprecedented job losses in the United States. So why is it that we're in the situation that we're in? And then second, in the latter part of the talk, we're going to turn to policy responses and we're going to ask, okay, what can we do to mitigate those job losses? And we're going to evaluate the causal effects of the major stabilization policies that have been enacted to date. So the stimulus program, the paycheck protection program, and so forth. Now, before I dive in, I want to point out that the findings that I'm going to present here are they build on and relate to a growing number of papers that have taken up this challenge of using novel sources of data that are now available from private companies uh, to, to analyze economic activity. And so I've listed a few examples here. One of the very nice things uh, that we've seen in the economics profession over the past couple of months is lots of people have uh, gravitated and identified creative new data sources to provide new insights into economic activity. And we are tying together some of those strands and building on that work to create a platform that we hope will be uh, useful for a number of folks going forward. So here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to start by describing the data that we've assembled and the tracker that we've constructed. 
I'll then talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on the economy, on consumer spending, on business revenues, on employment. And then uh, I'll next turn to the impacts of stabilization policies. And then we'll leave some time at the end to discuss what we think of as key policy implications going forward. And of course, leave time for discussion and questions. So with that, let me uh, dive in and start talking about the data, which are the foundation for this project. So this project is really made feasible through a partnership with a number of key private sector companies that have very generously agreed to provide data for social good to help form better economic and social policies in the context of this crisis. And so we've listed uh, our uh, partners here who uh, have provided data that's currently in the economic cracker and we should note continuing to add partners. So if anyone on the line uh, is uh, working with other data sources and would be interested in joining this effort, we'd more than welcome that. Let me just point out these partners here and what each of them are contributing. So we're getting data on consumer spending from Affinity Solutions, which aggregates credit and debit card information for a very large number of uh, customers in, in the United States and provides a great window into that uh, activity. We're getting data on small business revenues from Womply, uh, another company that's a credit card aggregator. We're getting data on employment rates, particularly of low-income workers from Earnin, Intuit, and Homebase. And then to measure things in the labor market and how they will look going forward, we're getting data on job postings, the jobs that firms are advertising essentially for all online jobs in the United States from a job posting aggregator named Burning Glass. And finally, we're getting some data on educational progress made by elementary school students from a platform called Zern. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of these platforms and how we're using that data as we go through the talk, but just wanted to give you a high level overview here. So what do we do uh, with that uh, data? So the key challenge here is that the data sources we're receiving, they're not like clean survey data that we're typically used to working with. They are raw transactional data from credit card transactions, for example. And one key challenge that that transactional source of data has is that it reflects each business's specific clients rather than necessarily providing a representative picture of national economic activity, right? So if one business happens to cater to a particular market segment, we're gonna get data that represents that market segment as opposed to the economy as a whole, which might be you know, more relevant for forming economic policy. So with that concern in mind, starting from the raw data, we construct series that are suitable for economic analysis by undertaking quite a bit of work uh, with three major steps. First, we're gonna to work to clean the series to remove various artifacts that arise in transaction data. So for instance, a credit card processor might switch the partners they're working with, or there might be seasonal fluctuations due to holidays and so forth. So there's a number of things that have to be done on kind of the back end to get a series that's interpretable and usable for economic policy. Second, recognizing that this data is private data and is uh, highly confidential, we are gonna aggregate the information, it's anonymized to begin with, and we're also gonna exclude small cells to protect privacy and index all of the values to January 2020. So we're gonna show everything as changes relative to January 2020, rather than showing absolute levels, which is quite helpful in protecting um, the privacy of businesses themselves. Finally, to address the central challenge I mentioned that these statistics might or might not be representative of the national uh, representative groups that we care about, we work hard to benchmark the data that we're showing here to national statistics uh, that are representative. And so I just wanna give you one example of that uh, before starting to show you what these data look like. So uh, we're gonna spend a bunch of time talking about data on consumer spending. And as I mentioned earlier, that data is gonna come from Affinity Solutions. Uh, Affin Affinity Solutions has data on credit and debit card spending. And you might wonder, is that a good picture into total spending in the economy? And so to assess that in this chart here, we're plotting in the green information from the monthly retail trade survey, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, just came out for this month a couple of days ago, which is a survey of about 13,000 uh, firms in the US that collects information on retail uh, trade, so in this case showing data for food service establishments 
among uh, many other sectors. And so that data is being shown in the green here. And you can see that, you know, it's kind of fluctuating across months in 2019. Then you see a sharp dip in 2020 and then a slight recovery in the most recent month in May 2020. Now the blue shows you the same exact data in Affinity. And what you can see here is that while they are not perfectly aligned, they're actually quite closely aligned overall. Uh, and so even though Affinity is capturing a particular part of the economy, what we see on credit and debit cards, it turns out to be a pretty accurate representation of overall national consumer spending, as you can see in this chart. Give you another example, if you look at retail services rather than spending at restaurants, food services, you again see quite highly correlated patterns. It's not perfect, but the way I think about it is in a, the scope of a crisis of this size, where we're seeing 30 or 40% reductions in spending, you know, you might be off by a few percentage points, but you're gonna get the big picture right, as you can see uh, from this data here. It tracks the national statistics pretty well. And so that's one example of how we've done this benchmarking. Each of the other data sets as well that we're gonna show you, you can look at the paper that we have online and we can post a link here, the chat window for those who are interested. Uh, you, can, you can see that these data sets are tracking certain relevant benchmarks quite well. Okay, so that's the data. I now want to give you a quick sense of what the economic tracker looks like before turning to the analysis that we've done of these data. And so to do that, I'm just gonna toggle over for a second and share this screen here, which is a platform that you can look at yourself if you go to trackTheRecovery.org. This is the economic tracker that we've built that is publicly available. And so the way this works is you can look at the top at a bunch of different outcomes, uh, consumer spending, which is what's being shown on the screen at the moment, uh, various measures of business activity, business revenues and so forth, employment, education, and then various relevant public health statistics. And so just to start off with this series here, this is from the Affinity Solutions data, uh, you can see that consumer spending benchmarked the January levels is kind of staying stable at that point. And then right at March 15, when the COVID crisis hits in the US and the national emergency is declared, you see a precipitous decline in consumer spending as measured on credit and debit cards. Uh, such that we're now uh, down, you know, about 35% or something like that by early April. And then right when the stimulus checks start to go out on April 15th to households, remember the $1,200 checks that were sent to many households, you immediately see a sharp uptick, which we're going to talk about in more detail later in this presentation. And then some gradual recovery since then, such that as of one week ago, we're about 11% uh, down relative to where we were. Uh, before the national crisis hit. So this is giving you the national picture. The power of these data is you can then disaggregate them in numerous ways. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example here. Let's look for instance at the data for West Virginia. So if you looked at West Virginia in isolation, you're gonna see this very rapid decline. But then when the stimulus checks go out in West Virginia, you see a recovery almost immediately to baseline levels. You're back to where you were before COVID. And if you look now, you're actually seeing higher levels of spending than you saw before the COVID crisis hit. So if you were to look at this graph in isolation just for West Virginia, you would think, okay, from a consumer spending perspective, it almost looks like the crisis has passed in, in West Virginia. But that picture looks extremely different if I look you know, right next door at North Carolina, where you see much less recovery, or even more extreme if I look at Washington, D.C., where I see almost no recovery at all. We're still down 30% in terms of consumer spending. And so this is one illustration. You can then dig in further to look at, of course, other states. You can look at the county level. You can look across metro areas. I'm gonna show you in a second that you can dig down to, to zip codes. Uh, and that we think can be incredibly illuminating as I hope to show you now, going back to the slides uh, that I was sharing here to analyze uh, these data and look at the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on economic activity. So uh, to start with that, um, I'm going to zoom back out to the national level uh, and start with the national accounts data, uh, kind of the big picture the statistic that's motivating this analysis, which is that GDP, the total output of our country, has fallen dramatically. And so that's shown in this first bar here. 
where if you look at data for the first quarter of 2020, relative to the last quarter of 2019, you see that GDP has fallen by $250 billion, which is about a 5% annualized reduction in GDP. Most of which, as we saw in that previous chart, is occurring in the last two weeks of March. So GDP is gonna fall even more in the second quarter when the entire three months are gonna reflect this lower level of economic activity. So let's start by asking in the national accounts data, what drove that reduction in GDP? As you'll know, GDP, the economic output, consists of four major components. Total uh, private domestic investment by firms, government purchases, net exports to other countries, and personal consumption expenditures, that is consumer spending. So if you look at these four components, you can see quite clearly that the key driver of the reduction in GDP in the United States has been a massive reduction in consumer spending. Now, that consumer spending uh, is what we are gonna analyze using data from credit and debit cards. Now, I wanna note that not all of consumer spending is reflected on credit and debit cards. Uh, in particular, if you just think about it intuitively, housing, healthcare, and cars are three key things that are not captured on credit and, credit and debit cards. Most people pay for those things with other, through other mechanisms. Um, and so this blue bar here essentially shows you the component of consumer spending that we're gonna be able to analyze with credit and debit cards, which you can see is still a very large chunk of what is driving the reduction in GDP. Now in the national accounts data, you'd basically only be able to do this much. You'd be able to do a disaggregation of what is happening at the national level uh, in, in this aggregated way. What we're now gonna be able to do, analyzing that credit and debit card spending data using the information from Affinity that I described is disaggregate that data to get a much finer picture of what is driving the reduction in consumer spending and what implications that has for economic policy. So I'm gonna disaggregate the data in a series of ways and I'm gonna start by disaggregating spending changes by household income. So the question we're gonna ask here is who cut spending more? Was it the rich or the poor? And the way we're gonna answer that question is by imputing income based on the median household income in the cardholder's zip code. So just as a technical note, we can't see in the credit card data what people's incomes are at an individual level, but we see where they live. And as a result, we can map those uh, cardholders to zip codes and then impute their income using the average income of people in that zip code in census data. And that works pretty well, it turns out, uh, because the US uh, is so segregated that I can get a good guess of people's incomes based on the zip code in which they live. Now, to show you then what that data uh, looks like, I'm gonna start with this chart here, which shows you consumer spending for people in the top income quartile, the top 25% of the income distribution by day for 2019, shown in the dashed line as a reference, and the same exact days in 2020. So as you can see here, starting in mid-March, there's a dramatic reduction in spending by the rich uh, such that by about mid-April, you're down about $3.1 billion per day of spending relative to a base of $8 billion per day. So that's a 31% reduction. And then you see a gradual recovery, but even at the end of the period as of June 9th, we're down about $1.4 billion, 17% relative to baseline values. So that's for the people at the top of the income distribution. Let's now contrast that with people at uh, the, the bottom of the income distribution in the bottom 25%. And there, as you can see, uh, you see a similar qualitative pattern, but a much smaller reduction, both in a percentage sense and in absolute dollars. So in particular, if you look at mid-April, low-income folks are spending 23% less than they were pre-COVID. And by the end of the period, they're basically back to baseline levels of spending. And so the key implication of this is that in order to understand consumer spending changes in the US, you really need to focus in this crisis on the top of the income distribution, why the rich are cutting spending so much because the top quartile of the income distribution accounts for more than half the reduction in aggregate spending in the United States by, uh, by June. And that's driven by the fact 
by that the rich both cut spending more in percentage terms and account for much more spending to begin with precisely because they're richer and end up spending more money. Okay, so that's point number one. This consumer spending chalk is driven uh, primarily by high income folks. Next, a different disaggregation that turns out to be useful in understanding what's going on. Let's disaggregate the data by sector. So what we're after here is understanding why spending fell. Was it because of a reduction in purchasing power? So that's usually what drives recessions. People lose their jobs, stock market falls, people have less wealth, that drives them to spend less. So is that what's go going on here? Or is it a, an intuitive alternative explanation that there are health concerns about COVID-19 and people are holding back on spending, going out to restaurants, hotels, and so forth because of that? So we are going to try to get at that by looking at the categories in which spending fell. And so what this chart is showing you is looking at that total reduction in spending that we're seeing overall uh, and asking in which categories did that reduction in spending, uh, which categories did it come from? And so you can see that the vast majority of the reduction in spending comes from what you might think of as in-person services, things like hotels and food, transportation, uh, recreational activities, all of which require you to basically go out of your house and be in contact with other, other folks, which obviously carries the risk of COVID infection. So that's the key driver in an accounting sense of what has driven the reduction in spending, which suggests that this is not fundamentally about a reduction in purchasing power. It seems to be about a reduction driven by health concerns. You can see that even more directly if I look at very specific categories. So let me give you a couple examples here. If you look at spending on things like installing a swimming pool in your house or landscaping services, that has actually gone up a little bit relative to pre-crisis levels. In contrast, if you look at spending on restaurants or airlines or barbers and beauty shops, they have plunged dramatically. Now, why is this example illuminating? If it was truly a shock to purchasing power that high income folks were feeling less wealthy uh, and that's why they cut back on spending, then you wouldn't think that they'd be more likely to install a swimming pool in their house. And so, you know, I think it's precisely that those are activities that don't carry health risks. And that's why we're continuing to see spending there and not in the activities that require in-person contact. Now, this picture of spending reductions is incredibly different from what we've seen in prior recessions. So in previous recessions, as some of you who study these issues might know, most of the reduction that occurs in spending occurs in durable goods. So people buy fewer cars, postpone purchasing a new refrigerator, et cetera. Virtually none of the reduction in spending, if you look at the data from the Great Recession, comes in services. In this recession, it's completely flipped. 67% of the reduction in spending, looking at national accounts data, comes from a reduction in service spending rather than durable goods or non-durables. And so the key lesson from this is that the shock here, the initial impact of the, the economic shock is extremely different from what we're used to seeing in the past. It's a reduction in spending primarily by the rich rather than the poor. So that to begin with is, is fairly different. And second, it's concentrated in a set of goods that require in-person contact, local services. So what I want to do next is walk through to the next piece of the economic chain. Consumers have reduced spending a lot. How does that now affect businesses? Before I do that, let me just pause and see if there are any questions to, to take here, um, Susan or, or Mike. Uh, if not, I will, I, will, I will continue ahead to the next piece. Um, Are very technical about data sources and uh, inflation and measurement issues. So I suggest why don't you go ahead and go to the implications of this, and um, and then we'll address them all and have a great conversation. Sounds good. Sounds good. And I hope folks are able to address uh, some of those in the Q and A chat window as well. Um, so let me now walk to the next piece of the chain and look at how this affected business uh, revenues. Uh, so how did the fall in consumer spending affect business decisions, right? So think about things like the decision to remain open, employment rates, hiring, and so on. So to answer that, we're going to use a particular strategy. We're going to use variation in the size of spending shocks across zip codes. So let me just walk you through the logic before turning back to the data. So remember, what we've just seen is that spending fell primarily 
among high-income households for in-person services such as restaurants. So think about where those services are uh, consumed and how they're produced. They're of course, of course mostly produced by small businesses that serve customers in their local area, right? So you tend to go out to restaurants where you live. And so what that means is we can use differences across zip codes in average household incomes or the degree of affluence basically to create variation as a source of variation in the size of the spending shock that businesses face. So a restaurant that happens to be located in a very high income neighborhood is gonna face a much larger spending shock than a restaurant that happens to be located in a neighborhood that uh, is lower income. And so we're gonna use that, as you'll see in a second, to analyze the impacts of the economic shock on businesses and then on their workers. So to show you how this works, let me start by just giving you an example. You can see this very clearly in a map. Here's uh, now disaggregating data from Wompley on business revenues by zip code in New York City. And so what we're showing you here is for every zip code in New York, how much did small businesses in that zip code lose in terms of total revenues uh, pre-COVID to post-COVID? And what you can see really are here is really some dramatic variations. Start by looking at the legend here, where you can see that in the darkest red colors, look for instance here in, uh, uh, in Manhattan, the Upper East Side, and so forth, you're seeing more than 87% reductions in revenue from pre-COVID to mid-April. In contrast, if you look at uh, areas up here in the, in the Bronx, you're only seeing about a 12 to 20% reduction in small business revenue. So just a massive difference in terms of the amount of business that's been lost across different parts of New York City. In particular, the more affluent areas in Manhattan experiencing dramatic reductions in business. You can look to give you just another example at San Francisco, very similar pattern. You look at the most affluent parts of the city, Pacific Heights, for example, or the areas right around the coast, 90% uh, reductions in small business revenue. Look across the Bay in the East Bay, look at less affluent areas like Hayward or up in San Pablo and Richmond, seeing 30% reductions in revenue. Now that pattern holds not just in New York and San Francisco, but broadly uh, across the United States. This is just a simple depiction of that. It's a bin scatter plot showing you changes in small business revenue from January to April, plotted against median two bedroom monthly rents in the zip code, a simple measure of the affluence of the zip code. And you can see that in the most affluent zip codes in America, businesses are losing something like 55 or 60% of their revenue in the least affluent parts of America, it's something like a 25% loss in business revenue. So that consumer spending shock is affecting businesses very, very differently, depending upon essentially the clients that they happen to cater to, given where they are located. Now, one final note on this, that uh, pattern is again, very much related to in-person services in particular. So if I look at the data for food and accommodation services or retail trade, things that require you to basically go out of your house to consume. You see that strong pattern I showed you before. If I look instead at, of, at finance and professional services, so think about accounting or tax prep, which you can do remotely, you don't see that gradient at all. So that again fits with this picture of health concerns driving this uh, reduction in spending and affecting businesses downstream. So let's now turn to the third and final link in this economic chain looking at impacts on employment. So what we're gonna do here uh, is start from recognizing that employment losses have been concentrated in particular at the low end of the income distribution. So if you look at data from ADP, there's some nice work being done by Kajner et al. Focuses at, uh, sorry, folks at the Fed uh, using ADP data to look at how employment losses have varied by income group. And they show that the vast majority of the employment losses come from people at the bottom of the income distribution, the bottom fifth, for example. So what, what we're gonna do here is disaggregate those losses and jobs at the bottom of the income distribution using data from a variety of sources. I'm gonna show you data here from Earn In. You see similar patterns in other data sources like Homebase and Intuit. Uh, and so again, I'm gonna start by showing you the patterns in a, in a simple map. So again, let's look at employment losses now in New York City. 
This is showing you the fraction of low income workers who've lost their jobs by zip code in New York. And you again see this incredibly stark pattern that I was showing you before. Uh, workers who happen to work in the most affluent parts of Manhattan, 70% of them have lost their jobs. If you look up here in the Bronx or you look at Queens, those numbers are more like 20%. So to, just to make that very concrete, if you and I both work in a restaurant and you happen to work in a restaurant in the Upper East Side and I happen to work in the Bronx, I'm much more likely to have my job still right now than you are. Right, so it's really playing out in a very different way, even for workers at the same skill level uh, in, in the same type of occupation. Now, this again shows you, this chart shows you that that pattern is true, not just in New York, but uh, throughout the country. If I look at more affluent areas, higher rent areas, I'm seeing a much larger decline in hours of work for low income workers in more affluent areas. Now, a couple final points on this. When we're looking at work uh, rates of work, we're looking at economic conditions right now. But what's going to matter in the recovery, of course, is the workers that firms hire going forward. And so importantly, you're seeing these gradients, not just in terms of the amount that people are working now, but also looking forward uh, in terms of the jobs that, that companies are posting. So this is plotting from the burning glass data, the change in job postings versus uh, rents. And you can see that businesses um, are hiring much less in affluent areas, particularly for low education positions that require a low level of education uh, than, than businesses located in less affluent areas. So that same exact pattern, which suggests that recovery is gonna take much longer in these more affluent areas where many low-income workers have been laid off. Interestingly, if you look at the same exact pattern for jobs that require a high level of education, you see no such pattern. And that makes good sense because at high skill levels, you tend to work in tradable sectors where your clients are not those immediately in your neighborhood. And so there's no relationship to, to local rents. Okay, so to summarize, what have we learned so far from this diagnostic analysis? We've seen that there's been a reduction in spending by the rich that has ultimately led to the loss of jobs for low-income individuals working in affluent areas. So why does that picture of the economy matter? It, it matters because prior research suggests that these types of very disparate job losses across regions and across sectors can persist for a really long time because we tend to have pretty limited mobility across areas and across sectors in our economy. So, you know, if it were the case that a worker who lost his job on the Upper East Side of Manhattan could easily go work in an Amazon warehouse located in some different part of the country, then this might not matter so much. But in practice, that doesn't happen. And so what you can end up with is kind of a scarring effect where we're going to see reduced economic activity for a really long time in many parts of the country because of how the shock is playing out. And the fact that job postings are already depressed in more affluent areas I think are early signs that there might be a long road to recovery for low-income households in affluent counties in this recession, barring policy efforts that might stem that decline. And so that brings me to the last set of issues that I want to talk about, uh, which I'll take a few minutes on, and then we'll, we'll turn to questions and discussion, which is to ask, okay, what can we do from a policy perspective to stem these uh, dramatic impacts that we're seeing in the economy? And so what I'm going to do is focus on three major policies that target the chain of events that we just saw playing out, the shock to consumer spending that affected businesses that then affect employment. We're going to talk about three policies that target this chain at different points. So first, state ordered reopenings. So the simplest thing you might think of is, can we just have executive orders that tell people, okay, the restrictions on stay at home orders and so forth are lifted. Let's just reopen the economy. Does that work? Second, uh, stimulus payments to households. Can we give people more money that they then go out to spend that will undo the economic chain that we just saw? And third, can we give loans to small businesses, the $500 billion Paycheck Pro Protection Program in particular, is that effective in sustaining employment in the midst of the crisis? So let me take each of these in turn. I'm gonna be relatively quick uh, in the interest of time, but happy to answer questions uh, at the end. So let's start with the state order reopenings. I'm just gonna show you one quick chart here that I think illustrates 
the key point. What we're going to do here is basically compare trends in spending and employment across states that reopened earlier versus later as sort of an experiment to understand the causal effects of these reopenings. And so this one chart, which is a case study, I think illustrates the broader picture quite nicely. So here we're tracking spending patterns in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, th this is a good comparison because Wisconsin and Minnesota both had shutdown orders at the same time, but then Minnesota reopened several weeks before Wisconsin did. And so if the reopening had a big effect on economic activity, you might expect to see a surge in spending in Minnesota right after it reopened relative to Wisconsin. But as you can see, you see no such thing. If anything, spending actually looks slightly lower in Minnesota afterward relative to Wisconsin. And more broadly, if we look at employment measures, we look at business revenues, you look at any number of statistics, you always get exactly this picture. In the paper, we do comparisons across many other states and aggregate this up. And our basic conclusion is that, at least in the short run, state-ordered reopenings have very limited capacity to increase economic activity. And I think that makes sense if you think, going back to the first part of the presentation, if the fundamental cause of the reduction in economic activity is concerns that consumers have about their own health, it's not about restrictions and th that the government's imposing, it's that people are worried themselves, then you can't undo that by just having an executive order that businesses are now reopened. You actually need to manage to restore consumer confidence, I think, to boost consumer spending. Okay, next let's turn to stimulus payments. So as I'm sure many of you will know, the CARES Act made direct payments to uh, nearly 160 million people in the US that totaled 267 billion as of the end of May. There were larger payments made to lower income households who typically got $1,200 per person. And the vast majority of those payments, if you look at deposit data, they were deposited on exactly April 15th, 2020, which turns out to be useful for our analysis, as you'll see in a second. So the question we're asking here is, was the stimulus effective in increasing consumer spending and restoring employment? So to analyze that, we are gonna go back first to the spending data and look at it at a very high frequency, look at it day by day, and look at what happened in particular to spending patterns for people at the low end of the income distribution, the bottom income quartile shown in the blue versus the top income quartile. So what you can see here from this first chart is that right when the stimulus checks went out, shown by the dashed line here, there was a dramatic and immediate increase in spending by low income households. And then there continued to be a recovery afterward. There was a much smaller increase for high income households, which makes sense both because they got smaller stimulus checks or none at all. And second, the marginal propensity to spend out of cash tends to be lower among high income households than among low income households. Now digging into this more deeply, and this really shows you the precision of these data, in this chart here, we're now plotting the data day by day for low income households without doing any smoothing at all. And what you can see is that exactly on April 16th, relative to April 14th, there's about a 25% jump in spending by low-income households right when the stimulus checks come in. So you can see that the stimulus is in fact having a huge impact on the amount that low-income households are spending. And now if I go down here to high-income households, you can see that it's having a much more modest impact on high-income households, as, uh, as I said earlier, for, for reasons you might expect. So from that perspective, it kind of looks like the stimulus at an initial crack worked in the sense that it did in fact increase total consumer spending. However, if you look now with the disaggregated data on what people were spending on, there's a wrinkle to the story, which is that most of the increased spending went to durable goods. So people started to buy more appliances and refrigerators and so forth. Um, and so if you look here, you know, on spending on durable goods, you see this really big jump. But if you now look instead at spending on in-person services, which remember is where most of the reduction in spending occurred to begin with, you see a much, much smaller impact of the stimulus check. So what is the key lesson there? The stimulus increases consumer spending, but it does not by any means undo the business revenue losses that occurred as a result of the COVID shock. So basically, the businesses that lost a lot of money, that were the ones supplying these in-person services, 
they didn't see ultimately the vast majority of the stimulus come to them. Rather, the stimulus went effectively to companies like Amazon and Walmart that, you know, big online retail presence, selling durable goods and so forth uh, that, that consumers chose, chose to spend them. So there's a disconnect between who lost as a result of the shock and where the stimulus went. That is true not just across sectors, but also across areas. So if you look at the recovery in terms of small business revenues, it's almost complete in, low, in, uh, in lower income places, low rent places, but in the high rent places, affluent areas shown in the dashed line here, which took the biggest hit to begin with, you're not seeing that much of a recovery because high income folks are not going and spending the stimulus at local businesses. And so as a result of that, perhaps, as a result of that disconnect, we're actually not seeing that much of an increase in employment yet, uh, even after the stimulus checks went up. Okay, so last, in the last couple of minutes, let me make one final point here about uh, loans to small businesses and the Paycheck Protection Program. So the CARES Act also provided $500 billion in loans to small businesses uh, starting on April 3rd. Those loans were forgivable if firms did not lay off too many workers. And in particular, firms with fewer than 500 employees were eligible for those loans. So was the Paycheck Protection Program effective in its intended goal of actually increasing employment among small businesses? So to analyze that, what we're gonna do is compare trends in employment for firms that had fewer than 500 employees, shown here in the green line, with firms that had more than 500 employees, shown now here in the purple line. And what you can see here is that these two series look basically identical. You essentially can't tell them apart. And what that's showing you is before April 3rd, before the Paycheck Protection Program, the purple sort of serves as a good control group for the green. They're trending together very closely. But then if the Paycheck Protection Program really had an effect, you would expect the green line to pick up in terms of employment levels relative to the purple line, but you see no such thing. Employment is down of low income workers by about 40, 45% in both groups uh, even now. Uh, and so that I think disappointingly suggests the fact that this, despite the fact that we spent $500 billion on this program, it did not in fact have a very large effect on employment rates. And you might ask, you know, how is that possible? We know firms took up these loans and uh, accepted this $500 billion of loans. What's going on? And what we think is going on is that the businesses who took up these loans may be exactly the ones who did not intend to lay off their workers to begin with. So to give you a concrete example, you see a very high take up rate of PPP loans among firms that are in the professional and scientific services sector. But a lot of those firms did not lay off many workers to begin with because they could work remotely. Um, but this was essentially, you know, free money from the government. Why would you not take that up if you could take advantage of it? And so the bottom line is we think, unfortunately, the PPP program may not be as effective as we had initially hoped. So to conclude, uh, I want to make uh, one last point, which is, you know, in this crisis, what we focused on here uh, is the immediate impacts of the COVID crisis on spending and employment. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that this shock may have lasting impacts going forward on inequality and social mobility in the United States for many years to come. And so just to give you a small illustration of that, I wanna show you one final piece of data that we've been tracking, which is on educational progress on an online math platform used as part of the school curriculum for about a million students in the US. And so what you can see here in this data is the number of math lessons that have been completed on this, math, on this online learning platform broken down again by income group. And what you can see is that for kids in high income families, they started to learn uh, you know, a little bit less math than they were before uh, after the COVID shock hit, but then recovered quickly. But if you look at kids in lower income families, you see a dramatic drop off, 60% reduction, and really no recovery after that. And why is that concerning? It suggests that even if we manage to mitigate the short run impacts of the shock, it's quite possible that years from now, we're gonna see the scarring effect uh, because of things like this, where lower income families in particular have been hit very hard. So with that, let me uh, just wrap up by talking about the path forward and then uh, open it up 
for questions. So the message I hope you'll take from this talk is that I think at the end of the day, there's limited capacity to reduce consumer spending through the traditional economic tools that we all are familiar with. Stimulus, loans to small business, things like that. I think fundamentally the long-term solution lies in addressing the virus itself through public health efforts to res restore consumer confidence. In the meantime, what can we do from an economic policy perspective? I think we can focus on limiting hardship among low-income workers who've lost their jobs by extending unemployment benefits, expanding the social safety net, possibly thinking about place-based policies targeting recovery in the hardest hit areas, and thinking about how we mitigate long-term impacts. For instance, do we prioritize reopening schools given the data that I just showed you as opposed to businesses? More broadly, I hope uh, what we've shown here is that private sector data, which I know a lot of you are working with, can provide an incredibly valuable tool to support economic policy in the age of big data. It can help us target aid more effectively and diagnose what the root causes are of economic failure more rapidly. And in that sense, we see the tracker that we've constructed here as what we hope will be a simple prototype for a system of sort of real-time national accounts building on the vision going back to Simon Kuznets in constructing the current system of national accounts that we all rely on, GDP, unemployment rates, and so forth from surveys. And uh, you know, as we work toward that goal, and we hope some of you will be interested in partnering in that effort, uh, I'd like to note that all the data that we've shown here are freely downloadable at this website, tracktherecovery.org, and we hope that that will be useful for your own efforts going forward. So let me end there and just note that all of this work was made possible by a very large team at Opportunity Insights. Uh, very grateful for all of the work that everyone in our team has done, and we hope that it will be valuable to all of you. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thanks so much, Raj. That was fascinating. Uh, you've been a pioneer now for so many years about looking at the geography of economic spending and using new types of data to get at questions around employment and social mobility. We've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. Um, I will not share any remarks, but I would just like to echo the last thing you said, which is it all comes down to crushing this virus. And when you look at how the US is doing on that perspective compared to Europe, um, or Asian countries, we're doing terribly. Actually, new cases are, are increasing. The good news is we're getting better at treating them. Death rates are going down. But um, we have not even come close to getting to where most countries in Europe, including Spain and Italy and the European countries that have been hardest hit, have gotten to in crushing this virus. So that is, does not bode well for what the rest of this year looks like. But I'm gonna start with some questions. We've had a couple, a lot of questions about geography both in the short term and long term. So in the short term, a lot of people notice that the, uh, I'll call them the 1%, uh, went off to their vacation homes in rural areas to just sit mm -hmm. out uh, and work from home. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you think some of the impact on small businesses and spending in affluent places like New York City has simply shifted externally? And then longer term, coming out of, of uh, this crisis, um, do you think that there would be a sustainable impact on where people choose to live, especially if we can do work from home and where businesses might choose to locate away from the largest urban centers and public transportation hubs uh, that over the last 10 years have attracted and created most of the jobs? Yeah. Uh, both excellent questions. So on the New York City example, uh, certainly for the very affluent, the top 1%, people who have second homes, there's some capacity to basically go somewhere else and that might be hurting small businesses in that area. So my sense is that is part of what's going on in New York in particular, but more broadly, Susan, I think you know when you look at the data across the US, leave out the top 1% areas and look at slightly less affluent places, I think that's less of a central mechanism and we're seeing this pattern very broadly. If you look at the more affluent, you know, not the very richest, but the 90th percentile in the Bay Area versus the 50th percentile. And so I think the that's an example of a broader phenomenon where people are cutting back and that's affecting local businesses. So I wouldn't think of this as just mechanically driven by people moving somewhere else, but I would see that as kind of one illustration of a much broader phenomenon that's 
affecting small businesses. Now, very interesting question, how long are these behavioral changes gonna persist? I hate to make forecasts because economists have a no notoriously bad record at uh, making any prediction. So I can't say I, I know for sure. My instinct is that we are definitely gonna see some sustained changes in the way people do things. I think we've all figured out that you can actually do things on Zoom in a reasonably efficient way as we're doing here. And maybe it doesn't make sense to fly across the country to give a talk and you can actually do this reasonably well and that might have some impact on the airline industry and the hotels and so forth. But my instinct is we also, and as my colleague Ed Glazer has shown, you know, there's just a tremendous value to interaction. And I think those of us who spent a lot of time on Zoom also recognize that at some point we would really like to be together in person and not just be in front of our computers. And I, my instinct is that is gonna kick back in. And so I'd be very surprised if there isn't a tendency towards agglomeration, as Ed Glazer calls it, uh, and an interest in being back in contact with, with people. So I don't expect us to kind of move to a, businesses that are locating in rural areas and everybody's living in rural areas. Right, Facebook uh, is the famous example there saying that they expect half their workforce to work remote um, in the coming years. Although then they also said they're gonna pay you less if you do move to Wyoming or Montana. Yeah. So that might have just uh, decreased the take up rate. Um, let's go to look. The fundamentally, uh, I think what you've shown resonates with everything. I've seen, um, I fully concur with you, forecasts are out, dashboards are in, we've got to look at real-time data. Uh, Google Mobility, for those of you who are, who are interested in this micro data, has some great data about foot traffic in different places, so you can see where people are moving about. Um, but structurally, what's happened, what you have highlighted is that there are a lot of crappy jobs in America, right? That there are is inequality in which you have very highly paid, highly skilled workers, and then there's a very large service economy that's dependent on them. And those service economy jobs typically don't have benefits, they have low wages, they don't have job security. Coming out of COVID, so the way certainly I view COVID, and I think all the now hundreds, if not thousands of companies I've spoken to over the last 13 weeks, view COVID is that we, this is a massive disruption, that the world coming out of this pandemic will not be the world we lived in in January. Um, air travel and Zoom, business travel, all of the economic activity, who knew that was dependent on people moving around. Mm -hmm. and I, think we, I think it's been startling, certainly to me and probably to you, just to realize how much of the economy was dependent either on me driving to the office or me getting on a plane and flying. Mm -hmm. um, and that is certainly gonna change. How people consume what they consume, it's gonna be more swimming pools, more online, more delivery, more curbside pickup and you know, less of many other things. But to get back to the point about creating better jobs, there are two potential opportunities here. One is uh, we're certainly um, uh, hearing a lot coming out of Washington where I live about what should be manufactured in America for national security. Uh, we used to call national economic security was dependent on tanks and airplanes, but now we realize N95 masks and some basic pharmaceuticals um, are quite important. So could this be um, an opportunity to create better jobs in manufacturing? Uh, and, then the, and then the second part of this would be what advice would you have for policymakers? So right now, Congress is also starting to consider a longer term stimulus, not an income replacement package, but a true stimulus package. So they're focusing on building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope it includes digital infrastructure so everyone has access to high speed broadband. But what else could we be doing to train workers for better jobs in the future and start to shift away um, from this bifurcated economy mm -hmm. of low wage, low skill service jobs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I mean, I completely agree with that perspective that this shock is going to both, you know, have a direct impact that illustrates the precarious nature of the economy, but also create an opportunity to potentially design an economy, as you put it, that creates more inclusive growth. And I think, you know, what you see in particular in the context of the data that I presented is how dependent low-income folks are on high-income folks spending, given the amount of inequality we have in the structure 
of our society. And I think this crisis is going to bring that out very saliently to the American public, precisely because the people who are going to have lost their job are the folks in your, working in your own neighborhood, the kind of data that I was showing you. It's not someone working in a manufacturing sector who you've never interacted with. It's somebody you know in the shops you go to and the, uh, the businesses you work in and so forth. And I'm hoping what comes out of that is taking a longer term view. You know, how do we get out in the short, mitigate the short run damage? I, as I was saying, I think that's partly about the safety net and giving people basically income support at a time where through no fault of their own, they're basically not able to work. But then I think using that as an opportunity relating to some of the work our group has done earlier on social mobility and how you lift people up, investing in things like education, but also thinking about social capital, thinking about the amount of segregation in American society. I think thinking about programs that invest in creating the skills that people need to take the types of new jobs that you were describing, Susan, if there is an infrastructure stimulus package, as I've been emphasizing, I think a pure traditional economic stimulus that we're just going to pump more money in and that's going to have a multiplier effect. I think there's a limit to how well that works in a, in a case where people are not spending because of health reasons. But if you can create new types of jobs and provide the skills for people to fill those jobs, that might have a sustained impact. You know, think of very effective retraining programs targeted at a certain sector of individuals. I'm thinking of a group called Year Up, for example, that has been very effective yes. in training uh, you know, workers for, for jobs at, at specific companies. Things like that, I think, can be incredibly valuable, especially when now people have lots of time to potentially pursue a better path, going forward a path that offers more growth. Terrific, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that we're over time. Uh, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. It has been um, great, as always, to see your innovative new thinking and data. Thank you for joining us, Raj. There are lots and lots more questions, hopefully, um, some of the members of your team will be able to get to them. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone. My pleasure. Thanks, Raj. Bye. Great. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, just as a reminder that the um, uh, recordings of past NAEP events are available through the NAEP Connect app. And uh, NAEP members can also download the recordings through the nave.com digital archive. Uh, and also just as a reminder that you can head over to NAVE's job board, econjobs.org, if you're looking for your next job in economics or for a qualified Thank you all. That does conclude the event. Today's program is copyright 2020 by the National Association for Business Economics with all rights reserved. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all. May not disconnect.